Well, thank you so much for the invite to speak here. I always enjoy um, talking with Dr. Browns and the clinicians relating to these topics that, um, you know, I guess as a background, I'm a, a researcher. My primary appointment is in research, but I also practice clinically. And so um, I have a strong appreciation for the need for clin clinically relevant um, research dissemination and answering some of these really tricky questions that we come up on multiple times throughout any given day. So today's talk is titled A Field of Gray, Exploring the Evidence to Guide Infant Dysphagia Clinicians Through the Most Common Clinical Conundrums. And um, I am a very black and white person in the way my brain works. My dad is a nuclear engineer and um, I think I've just learned that kind of thought process of engineer binary in my head. And so when I came into the field of dysphagia, as you can imagine, it was um, quite an abrupt awakening for me that it seems like very few things in our area are black and white. Instead, most of them are in the gray area. And so what we'll be talking about today in this lecture is really kind of my career focus, I would say, is bringing some more um, objectivity, bringing more um, black and white to some of these gray areas. And we'll talk about that more. Just before we get started, um, the support and disclosures that have made this possible, and I am extremely thankful for all of these. So I'm paid by the University of Minnesota Masonic Children's Hospital. Um, I've been fortunate enough to receive some grant support, University of Chicago Innovation Fund, um, the NIH, um, this has been partially um, supported by that, and Biogen as well, where I consult looking at spinal muscular atrophy. Um, disclosures for um, collaborations and other things. I'm VP of Research for Newborn Medical. I consult for Biogen and Avexis Pharmaceuticals. And of course, as you know, I'm um, a speaker with Dr. Browns here. So, and then I would say equally, if not more important, are the um, personnel that have been instrumental in the work that I'm doing and have done. Um, here, the work we'll be talking about today I've worked with some amazing undergraduate students at University of Minnesota that you can see here on the right, Abigail, Abby, and Anna. It's a mouthful and getting their names per person when we're talking quickly is nearly impossible, <laughs> but they have been instrumental in a lot of this work um, that we'll be talking about today. So, so as a background, as I said, um, you know, I'm a black and white thinker. And so clinically, sometimes I get so frustrated because it seems like very little of what we do is black and white. So here you have on the left a clinical case where you might have a patient who has clinical signs or symptoms of swallowing impairment. Maybe it's a, a baby in the NICU, maybe it's um, a, an outpatient, you know, whatever it is, they're showing some symptoms. And so you go ahead and we have these amazing diagnostic abilities. We have swallow study is just one option. You have fees, but let's say you're doing a swallow study here. And you do the exam and you get these results that are ambiguous. So you're hoping you go into this exam and you'll come out with some clarity of what's causing these symptoms. But oftentimes what happens is you get maybe an unclear result. So for example, uh, maybe this patient, you find a couple instances of isolated penetration on thin liquids. Um, you don't see any aspiration. And so I, then it comes down to what do you do about that? And that's really where I, I find it often is very difficult to discern is because one might say, well, um, in that case, this child is symptomatic. They have penetration. Why don't you go ahead and treat that? And then somebody else may say, as just penetration, we can't expect children to be perfect and let's move forward. This is not the issue. And we really have um, not a ton of, of clarity in how to figure out the best route to go. And certainly if we do go that route, you know, say we decide to thicken, for example, um, what's the best way to go about doing that in the safest way? So what we'll be talking about today is really just clarifying some of those clinical conundrums and how we can kind of change our thought process or how we can use the evidence to guide our thought processes to um, come to a decision that we feel more comfortable with. And I know personally some of these studies that I'll be presenting with you today have helped me feel more confident in the recommendations that I have because again, we're, we're really asking clinicians to function in a field where we don't have a ton of evidence to give you. 
And so I think clinging on to whatever you do have and at least having that background for why you're doing something is important. So what we'll be talking about today, first we'll go through healthy infant swallowing and aspiration. So is, is bolus airway entry potentially a normal variant? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the clinical significance of penetration and aspiration leading on to that in our children who are coming in for these exams where we find that. And then we'll talk about the risks of thickeners and alternative thickening agents. And again, each one of these will be taking a really deep dive in because I, I think that for many of you probably tuning in, you know the basics of this, but I, I find the really interesting things that are compelling for me and help me act clinically or when we get into the nitty gritty of why. So to start out, we'll talk about healthy infant swallowing and aspiration. So I started out my training in adult and I'm, I'm so thankful for that um, because I think it, it helped kind of calibrate my mind of um, potentially what we should start to think of expecting from our infants. So we know from the adult literature um, that in a sample, this was a study by, done by my um, good friend and colleague, Kendria Garand, and in a sample of 195 asymptomatic individuals that were between 21 and 68 years old. So this was this was sampled intentionally across the age spectrum, feeling different gaps. So it wasn't like a ton of older people. I was one of the subjects in the study, in fact. And in this study, they found that 11% of these healthy, normal adults um, exhibited penetration or aspiration on their swallow study. Um, 2% showing aspiration and 9% showing penetration specifically. So 11% had bolus airway entry and these were healthy normals, asymptomatic, respiratory wise, they were healthy. They didn't have any other conditions that would predispose them to swallowing disorders. Likewise, if we look just beyond bolus airway entry, we know that's just a tiny piece of the puzzle. If we wanna look at um, initiation of swallow, I know I have said this, times in the past and I try to check myself now, but often we say, well, um, they have a delayed initiation of swallow to the piriform sinuses. Well, I think this is just a good reminder that we maybe want to check our nomenclature. We really, one, don't know what normal is for infants, but in this study by um, Dr. Daniels and all, they, they studied healthy adults and they found that when healthy adults were taking sequential swallow, so swallow, 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 that 67% of them initiated their swallow below the level of the blocula. Um, and I find that, that really compelling in that when we're looking at infants that are, we're evaluating during a bottle feed essentially, or a breastfeed for that matter, but during a bottle feed, say during a swallow study, um, you know, it, I don't know, I think we should maybe check ourselves and if we think that an initiation in the pure forms is necessarily a, an aberrant and, and just kind of think about it a little bit deeper. If we know that 67% of healthy normal adults are doing this using that same type of sequential swallowing physiologic pattern. And I think when we're looking at how to translate this to pediatrics, this is my niece Reagan, and this is her just first learning how to walk and you'll see her kind of stumble around. Now, if we saw any adult walking around like that, we would think that maybe they were potentially overserved or they had some type of neurologic disorder. But in a child, we of course expect this. We know that they're not going to just get up and walk normally immediately, right? That we expect them to fall down. We expect them to make mistakes and have some imprecision in neuromuscular control. They, in fact, have an immature neurologic system. And we know from clinical assessments that we should expect the same thing to an extent in feeding. So the data that we have here um, is showing, well, a few things I can use, I'm gonna use the highlighter to kind of point out here, is that um, down here we see this is healthy infant four hours of life. And so they here have a sucking pressure transducer in the bottle nipple, and then they have a pressure transducer in that infant's pharynx so that they can map the, the relationship between when sucking is occurring and when swallowing is occurring. And so you can see down here that in the first four hours of life, it really just looks like one of those Charlie Brown things over his head. It's just this big squiggly mess. 
um, which you may think, okay, fine, what is it supposed to look like? Well, here we can see, let me get out of this, that if we look at four weeks of life, again, this is um, a much more mature pattern. So just comparing the sucking signals, you can see a much faster rate, much more smoothness in the signal, more rhythmic. Um, and you see the same thing with swallowing. And likewise, when we look at the coordination, which, which is, again is looking more at that neurologic control of the muscles, we can see that we have this beautiful um, pattern here. So certainly quite a difference than what we see over on the left. So again, this is just showing in a month's period that that child is developing and, and maturing in their feeding abilities. Now you can do the same thing, and this, this work has also looked at it in quantitative terms for the sucks per burst. So we know that we increase between four hours and four weeks of life, the number of sucks per burst from 10 to an average of 21 before they take a suck burst break. If we're looking at suck to swallow ratio, we know that increases from a one to one to a three to one. You know, I'll say this, most of the data on suck to swallow ratio has not controlled for bottle nipple, um, which certainly needs to be done, but that's beyond the point. We see sucking rate, as we saw below, is going to increase and in the amount that they ingest per swallow increases. And again, this, this is sort of required for survival. If they don't increase their sucking and swallowing rate, if they don't increase how much they express, then there's no way they're going to be able to meet nutritional needs in the same or less amount of time. And so this maturational process is really quite important. So I guess the question I pose is this, and that is, if, if we know that healthy normals, 11% of them are penetrating an aspiration in the adult population without otherwise impairments, we, we expect that infants are going to stumble a little bit when they're starting to learn how to walk and it's not going to look pretty. Um, why would we expect an infant to swallow without occasional bolus airway entry? And I'm not saying that we should, this is a question I'm posing to you and I have some data that I think, um, I hope triggers some kind of thoughts in your head in the sense that um, how, how do we respond to this when we see it in evaluations and how do we know how much of a big deal we should make out of it? Here is a study that we're doing. Again, I was really curious about what are healthy normal infants doing? And so um, to start out, what we did is we recruited, this is just pilot data. This is a big study we have going on right now. Well, this is five of them, but we will have about 143 um, participants. And um, what we did is we recruited mothers who had healthy term infants, and we had them track the number of times their baby coughed per feed for 48 hours a week, so two days. Um, again, these were healthy infants. All of the babies here shown are breastfed, um, but in our big data set, we have some that are breast and some that are bottle fed, and each color is representing a different infant. So you can see here, just to point out some of the, the key landmarks, I know at first it just is a bunch of squiggly lines, but you can see how old they are on the x-axis. This is weeks. So in the first week of life, we have on the y-axis is the percentage of feeds that had a cough. So here you can see that this participant right here in the blue was coughing around 85% of feeds the first week of life. And again, that was recorded over two days, day and night of feeding. Well, we have this participant subject four down here in the blue that didn't cough at all. And that is just great. I mean, that variability there is just amazing to me. But what's even more interesting is that we can see, at least in the small data set, and who knows once we get all of the data together how this will look, but we see sort of this um, acclimation period. And, and by the fourth week of life that you can see here is that everyone, all of these bars have sort of come together. Some kids cough more, some kids cough less, but they're all a lot closer together. And that ends up being that on average of these participants we have that they coughed 23% of feeds. And so that means that at least one time they coughed in 23% of feeds, they might have coughed more than that. And we have that data we're collecting. So certainly this is just based on clinical assessment. Um, we can't be sure of what the cough during the feed means. It seems pretty intuitive to me that a cough during 
a breast or a bottle feed would indicate that there was some bolus airway entry, whether it was penetration or aspiration. We certainly don't know from this data. Um, but if we're expect if if this is accurate in healthy healthy infants that they're doing this 23% of feeds um, by the fourth week of life, again, that's just further further data to support that maybe this this expectation that we're going to have these objective assessments without any bolus airway entry is that reasonable so with that said let's move on to the clinical significance of penetration and aspiration now that we're saying well potentially there's a chance that um, healthy term infants all do this and so those infants that we're evaluating maybe we're just seeing it in those so just to start out i i want to put out a point and before jumping too much in this, I by no means do I want you to think that I am somebody that puts every child on thickened liquids. I certainly do not. In fact, I'm probably on the other end of the spectrum where I'm more liberal and will let, um, you know, if a child is systemically stable, as long as the team is in agreement, um, I would probably say, let's kind of see how they do before thickening. But the data, um, is is hard to ignore and there's certainly some kids based on the data that this is helping in um, alleviating their symptoms so studies looking at the effect of thickened liquids show an overwhelmingly beneficial treatment effect on reducing bolus airway entry and feeding symptoms and this is something important because in dysphagia i i started to work a lot more with pharmaceuticals and looking at the effect of some um, pharmaceutical drugs on swallowing um, and it's kind of opened my eyes to the fact that in pediatric dysphagia at least um, a lot of what we do is we either look at physiologic or these functional outcomes but we rarely look at the correlation between both and they seem you could have a physiologic deficit or the result of one bolus area entry but it doesn't always correlate to a functional improvement, such as a reduction in symptoms. So looking at both of these is important. And based on this data, we know that in the cardiac population, for example, if you have single ventricle infants like hypoplastic left heart, status post stage one palliation, those who were provided thickened liquids during their swallow study, they were provided thin, and then if they had an impairment, they were then provided nectar liquids. They had 45% had a reduction in aspiration, so they no longer aspirated, and that was a significant reduction. The same thing has been found in children with Down syndrome. So 57% in reduction in aspiration if they were provided nectar versus thin. And um, other populations like laryngeal malaysia and, and et cetera, as you can see, 33, 31%. So the overall end conclusion of this is, is certainly with, on a swallow study at least, these were all done with swallow studies, is that we can reduce bolus airway entry by providing a thicker liquid. Now onto the functional outcomes, is, is this actually improving symptoms? So um, this study was done, this was looking at children who either aspirated or penetrated on their swallow study and therefore the clinician had recommended to use thickened liquids. These were all term infants that were between one to 18 months. They didn't have any structural deficit that could contribute to their swallowing problem. 57% of the patients showed aspiration on their swallow study and 43% showed penetration. And they used all sorts of different thickeners, which we know, um, well, well, I shouldn't say we know, we, we would think based on what we know about differences in viscosity have different treatment effects. So looking at this, some of these patients were on thick and easy, some were on um, simply thick, and they had different thickening regimens that you can see here. So not perfect in the sense of looking at each one, but what is the most important and takeaway point, which is great, is that you can see these little stars are indicating a significant reduction. So this um, light blue bar is indicating um, post-treatment and this is pre-treatment. So x-axis is percentage of infants showing this symptom. So for example, we have about 45% of infants that before they received treatment were wheezing 
And then they had parents fill out questionnaires and they found that about 15% were wheezing after treatment. So a significant reduction in wheezing. The same types of reductions were seen in children that were vomiting, those who were resisting feedings, those who were coughing with feedings, and those who had congestion and apnea during feeds. So showing this functional improvement with thickened liquids. As you know, we can certainly have some negative side effects of these liquids. So 27% of the infants that were in the study had gastric side effects. These included belly bloat and loose stool. And um, this resolved in the majority of patients when they switched from thick and easy to simply thick. Certainly we have some contraindications for using simply thick in our infants, um, just reporting the basic premises of the facts of the thickening effects here. This study is really interesting. This was done um, by my colleagues at Boston Children's, Duncan et al. And this evaluated the outcomes among 137 infants that were less than two years old who exhibited isolated penetration on their first swallow study. And these are the ones that I, I struggle with um, the best course of action to do is that, you know, you see penetration, you didn't see any aspiration. What do you do next? And so what this study found, if you look over here on the right, is that of all the participants that you can see up here, um, this was just based, this was retrospective again. So clinicians on average, about, about half said no intervention is needed. That's just penetration. We don't need to do anything about that. And then on the other side, we had 55% that they said, okay, well, you know, you're coming in, you need to have a treatment for it. So when the two treatments that they looked at was thickening their liquids or changing flow rate, 27% had change in flow rate, the majority were receiving thickened liquids. And so at the bottom, you can see the percentage of infants where symptoms improved. So 19% of the infants that didn't receive any intervention had an improvement in symptoms, just, just going on anyway. Those who had a change in flow rate, 36 had an improvement in symptoms. And those who were thickened, 91% had improvement in symptoms. And from, if you're looking at was this a statistical significant improvement, they found that when you compare those who received some treatment versus those who received no treatment at all, that those who received a treatment, regardless of if it was a change in flow rate or thickening, had a significant, significantly greater reduction. So it was, it was a better way to handle it than to do nothing. Um, they also had less total hospital admissions and um, improvement in pulmonary health during their hospital admissions. They then looked at the difference in the effect between reducing flow rate and receiving thickening liquid, thickened liquids. And in this study, again, they found that both of either of these treatments were better than doing nothing, um, but those that received thickened liquids had a significant improvement. So showing that this was potentially, again, this is retrospective, but potentially a more beneficial treatment for the alleviation of these symptoms. That doesn't take into account the symptoms or the contraindications or complications that come about from thickening. What I find very interesting and important to keep in mind, and I talk to my colleagues about this a lot, is that of those infants, again, these were 137 infants that had no aspiration, just penetration on their swallow study. 26% of those infants had, well, let me back up. These infants had, many of these infants had follow-up follow swallow study exams. Of those who had follow-up swallow study exams, 26% exhibited aspiration on a follow-up exam. And I think I would imagine most of us have been in this position before where um, you do a follow-up exam and you see that, in fact, if you're looking at bolus airway entry, that they've actually declined from where they were before and then parents are all rattled. Why is my child doing worse? You know, I don't think that they are necessarily doing worse than they were before unless they have a neurodegenerative type of disorder, which most of our dysphagia patients don't have. Um, I, I think what we're seeing here, and it's important to keep in mind, is that potentially, Penetration is just the precursor to aspiration. We're looking at a swallow study, which is a tiny sample of a typical bottle feed or a breastfeed for that matter. And that um, we just didn't capture the impairment, but we saw the stumble before the trip. So that's potentially one. I think the other 
thing to keep in mind is that um, a lot of places, and we won't be talking about today, there's another lecture I've done on this through Dr. Brown's looking at how to standardize our swallow studies, is that if we have variable ways that we're doing our swallow studies, it's much more likely that we just didn't capture that impairment because we had a different way. So maybe during the second exam, maybe that clinician looked at more swallows. And so you saw more, maybe you looked at more swallows later on. Um, so really, I think as a community as a whole, we need to start to make greater strides towards standardizing how we're looking at these so we can better interpret the results. So the next, um, I guess, question I wanna answer is, you know, penetration and aspiration. When are thickened liquids indicated? Because it sounds sort of like what I'm saying is you know, against itself, is that, you know, potentially maybe healthy term infants are having penetration and aspiration, yet the research I just presented is showing that when you treat them, they have better outcomes than when you don't. So, you know, should we be giving every child slower flow or thickening liquids um, based on this, this fact? Well, Kind of my guideline that I use in determining this is when do I, when would I thicken? And that is when the symptoms pose greater threat than the negative effect of the thickeners. And so what I'll present next is sort of looking at some of those negative effects and potentially how we can circumnavigate some of those. So here is on to the risks of thickeners and um, potential for alternative thickening agents. So here's just a little table of some of our thickening options. So at the top, we have our cereals. We have rice cereal and oatmeal. Um, and we, we all know clinically the limitations here, right? Is that, you know, they're available. We can use them in younger infants. There's not necessarily population age requirements on these at this point, um, at least for oatmeal. But, you know, from a cohesive standpoint, how, how, how good is this agent at creating a nice thickened liquid? Eh, it's not that great. It often clogs the bottle nipple, it separates. You're never quite sure you're giving the child the desired viscosity you want. We have these, um, oh, we have these other thickening agents that work um, better and they create a much more smooth cohesiveness such as Simply Thick and Gel Mix and modified cornstarch thickeners such as Thick and Easy, Thick Enough, Thick It. Um, but they have some pretty big contraindications for use. So as you know, for Simply Thick, um, you can only use that if they're full term greater than 12 months old, and they're contraindicated for preterms or children less than 12 years if they have a history of neck. Um, gel mix is a great one that we can use for thickening breast milk, um, and it makes a really smooth, cohesive um, mixture. But of course, this, these are the guidelines that um, Boston had developed with, that indicates that if you're going to be using slightly or mildly thick liquids, so um, nectar or less, then they have to be greater than 42 weeks postmenstrual age. And if you're going to go from moderate to extremely thick, such as honey, then they must be greater than one year's age. And I would say that general practices, these are like guidelines. There really haven't been any studies looking at the gut implications of really any of these thickeners in a, in a rigorous way. So these are just general guidelines based on experts who have kind of put their heads together and figured out we need to control this in some way. And then of course, a lot of these modified corn starches, it's three plus years or just not indicated for preemies. So recently, or, or I guess like within the last five or so years, maybe there's, there's been a lot more discussion about arsenic in rice cereal. And I am first to admit, I, um, I was re kind of resisting this, this information in the beginning because clinically, um, for the options that we had, especially in the NICU, rice cereal uh, anecdotally worked so much better than oatmeal. And so, the reason that people were saying not to use rice cereal was because they were saying that there are high arsenic levels in it. And just as a background, we're gonna dive into this a little bit more because I, as a result of just hitting my head against this a number of times, I kind of did a deep dive literature review into it. 
And so what is arsenic? Well, it's a metalloid element commonly found as a compound in water and food as a result of contamination. It can be there as a result of just natural deposits, you know, that are part of the environment. It can be there because of mining or manufacturing. And this is ranked as a group one carcinogen. You can see in this table over here on the right, it's, it's the um, ranking of different substances. So there's an agency for toxic, sub, toxic substances and disease, disease registry. And what they do is they rank chemicals based on number of factors, and then they get a, like a composite score. So some of the factors that they look at in ranking how dangerous something is, is frequency of occurrence, toxicity, and the potential for human exposure. And so based on this, you can see this list, the rank number one is arsenic. So clearly a pretty significant thing. You can see lead, which we're all familiar with, and mercury, and you go down the list. So what are the implications of arsenic exposure? Well, uh, it turns out there's a lot of them. Unfortunately, most of our knowledge on the implications of arsenic exposure are based on um, studies that have been done in other countries where they have crazy high exposures because of some really bad events, like maybe a plant that wasn't controlling for things well, and therefore we had these really high exposures and things like that. So, so most of these are, are looking at extremely high levels. Um, but in many of, in these studies, they found that those who have these high level arsenic exposures are at increased risk for cancer, so lung, bladder, and kidney. And in fact, they have a four times increase in mortality as a result of it if you get above um, this 850 threshold. They have increased respiratory morbidities, bronchiectasis, mortality, lung volumes and capacities are reduced, congestion, cough, lower respiratory infection. Most of the outcomes we're talking about here are seen in adults, but actually these respiratory implications have been seen in infancy, which is interesting given these are often those things that we're trying to resolve by thickening liquids. There are cardiovascular deficits, neurologic problems, and immune systems, infant mortality from infectious disease and inflammation. Again, the inflammation um, is another thing we're trying to treat with these thickened liquids, not necessarily from arsenic. But again, in these high doses, the typical latency for all of these side effects are 20 to 30 years, just to kind of put it in perspective. So how do people have arsenic exposure? Well, you can get arsenic exposure from drinking water wells. So um, if you're on city water, such as myself, this is regulated by the government um, and the water lines to make sure that we're below the, this. they have set like limits for what arsenic exposure is acceptable. So this um, 10 is the limit that they have for, you know, main water systems. For those individuals who have well water though, that is not regulated at all. And so I'll be talking about a study next that actually goes into this and the different levels in that. The other um, place that we can get arsenic exposure is through food exposure, such as rice. So arsenic is present in low volumes in rice products, grains, and infant formula, in fact, just which is interesting. I never knew about that before. And again, recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics, they had recommended 36 teaspoons or three quarters of a cup of rice per day, no more than that, I should say, because they didn't want to exceed appropriate levels of exposure. Again, as with anything, if you stay below a certain level of exposure, you're fine. You don't have anything to worry about. It's just once you start to exceed these. Now, infants are at higher susceptibility to arsenic effects, which is important to keep in mind. One thing about this American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation for limiting a child's intake of rice products to three quarter cups per day is that they don't have any actual specifications on age, which when I first read kind of surprised me because you would think that what you would recommend for a little infant would be quite different than an older child. But I think my perception of why this is, is that they, we just don't know. We don't know enough about the effects of arsenic exposure, so 
trying to delineate ages is just so far out of what we are capable of doing right now. So this is important. This is copied and pasted right from American Academy of Pediatrics. And this indicates if your child has a swallowing disorder or reflux and needs cereal thickeners added to formula or breast milk, the American Academy of Pediatrics suggests using oatmeal. Also talk with your child's pediatrician or feeding therapy specialist. So this is pretty straightforward. We have very few things that in our field that are like, don't do this or do this. And this is a pretty straightforward, the American Academy of Pediatrics is saying, don't, be, don't use rice cereal because of these effects. Here is a study that is looking actually, again, all these other studies were looking at crazy high levels, right? Because of like kind of natural disaster type scenarios. Um, this was a really interesting study. It was a New Hampshire birth cohort study. And what they had is new moms um, send in a sample of their water and, um, and then they measured the arsenic exposure within the infant's um, diapers as well. They can do an analysis of this from their urine. And they found that 10% of these families had water exceeding the recommended limit. Um, and that was because of well water. But for the most part, again, most people weren't on well water. And so they were, the water source for their arsenic exposure was quite low. Um, but what they did find is that there was 7.5 times increase in arsenic in formula than breastfed infants. So what you can see is that over here, so for every increased ounce in formula intake the child had, they had a 2.6% increase in arsenic level. Again, this is primarily because of the formula, the arsenic that's just in the formula. This is not on children having thickened liquids. So they compared children that were breastfed that were not getting um, water, you know, from the from the tap or formula, those that were getting breast and bottle, and then those were that strictly formula fed. And here is their urinary arsenic level. So you can see the stepwise increase um, based on feeding modality. And this last study, which is of of great interest and certainly requires some extrapolation here is this was a model, which now uh, thanks to COVID, we're all very familiar with how models work. And so th these are kind of estimates based on some standard assumption, right? And, and so by no means is anyone saying this is perfect, but this is sort of the best we can do at this stage. So they made some assumptions for um, arsenic levels in water saying that, okay, let's say that you are not exceeding the arsenic levels from water, which most people don't. And we, they did some analyses on how much arsenic is in rice cereal. And then they said the average child at four months, let's say they have six teaspoons of rice cereal per day. And they had stepwise increases through that. But for the sake of time, I won't go into it. But you can see this is showing the average daily dose of arsenic that these children are receiving and attributing it to different sources. And so this graph over here is just showing that as the child increases in age, well, the amount of rice cereal that they consume in theory is going to increase the amount of, um, and that therefore increases how much overall exposure they're getting. And if you're looking at the source for the exposure here, they found that 54% of the arsenic exposure the child was receiving was from rice cereal in this, um, with the second being other solids and water. So what I did was I tried to extrapolate this a little bit into um, the clinical significance for, for us, for those who potentially are using rice cereal for a thick, as a thickening agent. So the World Health Acceptable Cancer Risk from Water they have is 10 to the negative fifth power. Um, again, this is one of those things where we don't necessarily know exactly what number this should be, um, but this is sort of the acceptable level right now. Um, and this study, the overall back, the overall conclusions from that study I just presented said that based on this acceptable cancer risk level, that the total infant intake Per risk was minimal risk. So those infants that we just showed on this slide previously, go back, 
that the, that despite having these exposures that you can see, that that still places them at minimal risk because it's it was just at this 10 to the negative five, which is what we say is this acceptable value. You know, you're not in the cancer threshold. And so what I said is, okay, well, those calculations that they made in that study were based on um, children that were not having any rice cereal added to their bottles. And so let's just say that a child is taking formula. Um, they're having six feeds per day. They're on mildly thick liquids and their total intake therefore is 36 teaspoons of rice per day if it's one teaspoon per 20 milliliters. So based on this, um, that places them at this 36 teaspoons right here. Increasing anything above that, any increase in the amount that they're taking or thickness or any other variable is going to increase the viscosity um, and it will place them above this American Academy Pediatric recommendations for how much rice cereal you should have per day. Um, this, in fact, places them at this 10 to the negative um, 6 carcinogenic risk. So more than they said potentially, they to back it up, this again I said was sort of an estimate. They said it could be a, a different level and this could be potentially placing them at increased risk. So I think the bottom line is that's a lot of numbers. Um, the, the key things we know is that too much arsenic is not good. Um, American Academy of Pediatrics has felt strongly enough about this to kind of draw a line in the sand and say, you sh and generally speaking, you shouldn't be having more than 36 teaspoons per day. And um, based on what I'm showing you here and, kind of, and concurrent with their recommendations saying, we really shouldn't be using rice cereal as a thickener. So that leaves us sort of at a bit of a sticking point um, because again, this is one of our um, go-to go -to treatments historically was rice. You can use oatmeal, but it just is kind of clumpy, doesn't work quite as well. And so what do we do for those infants who are preterm, maybe they are younger than the thresholds that we can use gel mix and things like that on. And so the um, students that I showed at the beginning of this presentation, and myself started to look at that this year. And um, for those of you who are familiar with this, we started a, a new standardization initiative. Uh, well, I guess I should not say we did. Um, the ITSE group started this initiative and we are implementing it. Um, and that is that, hey, we have a now have a clinically feasible, easy method to measure thickness of different liquids. So all you do is you take um, a 10 milliliter syringe. It has to be a specific type. So if you're wanting to do this, I would recommend going to the ITSE website. Um, you cover the nozzle, fill it up to 10 milliliters, release the nozzle, let it drip, and let it drip for 10 seconds, and then plug it back up and see how much left is left in that syringe. And based on how much is left, how many milliliters is left, it'll correlate to one of these liquids. To to complicate things a little bit, we have new nomenclature as well. So where we used to have thin, half nectar, nectar, and honey, we now have it's called thin, slightly thick, mildly thick, moderately thick. So I think it's taken a little bit of adjustment for everybody, myself included, but you can see here, these are the different milliliter requirements left in the syringe for each category. So what we did is we did ITSE testing, which is this method, and we tested under a couple different conditions. So first we looked at just standard infant formula, and the two formulas we looked at were Similac Advance and Enfamil Infant. And we looked at these in two formats. So we know that in the hospital setting, we often use the ready-to-feed formulation. So we did ITSE testing on just this, the ready-to-feed. And then we also looked at the powder variant as well, like you typically would use at home. We did testing, we did ITSE testing on each for every five minutes for 30 minutes to replicate the maximum duration of a feed. And then we wanted to know, well, in theory, if you're adding more powder formula per ounce or two ounces of water, um, if you had for higher caloric densities, that um, in theory, potentially it could be thicker based just based on higher caloric density. And so for each of these, the powder variant, 
we tested the ITSE values for 20 kcal, 22, and so on up to 30. We then did the same testing methods on anti-reflux formulas. So we tested Similac Spit Up and Enflamil AR, and they're ready to feed and they're powder formulas. And here are the results that we'll talk about. So first we'll talk about just the standard formulas, the non-AR formulas. So here you can see a lot of graphs are going to follow this same kind of um, format. So I'm going to take a little time to go over that with you. So along the x-axis is time. So you can see 0, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, and so on. The y-axis is the residual volume left over in the syringe, which again correlates to a thickness level. So this white bar is indicating it's a thin liquid. Gray is slightly thick, mildly thick, and moderately thick, as you can see over here. I put, if you're, if you're not quite used to the ITSE values, um, I hear ya, I put the, the cortlets under it as well. So you can see here, the yellow bars are indicating infamil formulas, infamil infant, and the blue bars are indicating Simlac Advance. And you can see in 20 kcal formulations, um, in the ready to feed and the powder formula, so no matter what way you grabbed it, if it was off the shelf in the powder or if it was ready to feed in the liquid form, that they were all thin liquids, okay? These bars are just staggered for the site of viewing. They were, all, they were all zeros or very close to zero. So then we looked and we examined the effect of caloric density. So here you can see on the left, this is infamil infant, and we can start with that. So each one of these lines we can see is a different caloric density. We have 20 kcal, 22, 24, 26, so on. And you can't make out all the lines strictly because they're all overlapping, and that's because caloric density in just a typical infant formula had no significant change on the ITSE value. They still remain thin. And the same thing over here, you can see for Similac Advance, it had no effect. We then went on and we looked at the anti-reflux formulas. So Similac Spit Up and Infamil AR. So this graph is showing the ready to feed versus spouter. So this is Infamil AR. Um, the solid line is ready to feed and the dashed is powder. So first to draw your attention, let's look at the ready to feed, the liquid formula that most of us get if we're working in the acute care setting. So here you can see the ready to feed, Enfamil AR um, is a slightly thick liquid, just barely, but it is, it's a slightly thick liquid. Um, and I say just barely, again, we have these sort of, I don't wanna say arbitrary, but to some extent they are arbitrary delineations between thickness levels. We say, okay, now you're officially a slightly thick. Um, but I think it's also important to keep in mind how far different it was from the other. So if you recall, the Enfamil um, non-anti-reflux was way down here. It was very close to zero. So we had a really big increase in thickness with that ready to feed. Um, and it was actually quite stable throughout the entire 30-minute testing period. Now that's different from Enfamil AR powder like you get from home. So you can see initially this is a thin liquid. By the time we get to about 20 minutes, it becomes slightly thick and in fact gets thicker than the ready to feed, um, but not until 30 minutes. So not only do we see that they are not the same thickness levels in the beginning, in fact, the powder is, is not, if you're looking to provide an infant with a thickened liquid alternative, then using this powder is really not going to achieve that. Um, but the other thing that we see is that we have this increase in thickness over time. Um, in talking to Enfamil company, um, they have essentially uh, products in the ready to feed formula that give them the shelf life that make it so that these are stable and don't change over time where the powders don't have those, which is likely why we see this increase. So from a clinical perspective, if you have a child that needs thick and liquids, they, they can't, their oatmeal, you don't want to go that route because it's too clumpy and they're not old enough for something like gel mix, this is showing that, yes, in fact, the Enfamil AR ready to feed is a really great potential option, 
for providing a slightly thick liquid. But keep in mind that when you go to transition them home to powder, it's going to be a completely different scenario. Um, and it really won't be effective until you're further into that and it's going to keep thickening. So getting it out of the nipple could pose some serious problems. This is the same graph. I just added the Simlax spit up to it. So here you can see, again, the Simlax spit up in the ready to feed form here is at the top solid bar and the spit up powder is below. So in both of these, the Simlax was always a thin liquid. It never got to a slightly thick designation across either one. The spit up ready to feed was thicker than the spit up powder, but again, they were still both thin liquids. Then we looked at the effect of caloric density. And if you recall, when we looked at the effect of caloric density on just the typical non-AR um, formulas, it made no impact. It didn't change the thickness. What you can see here is very different results when we look at those AR formulas. So here, each one you can see, these are the powders, again, because you wouldn't really increase caloric density of a ready to feed. And so here you can see this is the 20 kcal, 22, 24, 26, 28, and 30. Uh, from a research standpoint, this is a beautiful graph just because things line up really stepwise is as you increase caloric density, you're increasing the thickness level. I will say this, and I can't reiterate this enough. Um, Infamil does not recommend formulating this beyond 24 kcal because of this increase in thickness and they say that it increases even further in the gut with the acid. So this, these top values are strictly for scientific purposes. I uh, wouldn't use those clinically at this stage. But again, what you can see is we can get into this slightly thick liquid range in um, a powder. It just requires a higher caloric density. The caveat, again, being those powders don't have those stabilizers in them. So we have this increased thickness effect that um, if you look at any of the parent groups that are talking about these infamil ARs, they say my child can't get it out of the bottle nipple and things like that as they go into the feed, which is probably a result of this increasing thickness. And then we looked at the effect of caloric density on sim spit up, so just the correlate of that. And we found that th these results were much more consistent with the non-AR formulas. So that having increased caloric density did not impact the thickness level within a, a category of this one, of Simlax itself. So what are our overall conclusions from this? Well, if we're looking at Simlax spit up, um, this did not become a thickened liquid under clinical testing conditions. So um, this actually happened to me the other day. I, I needed a slightly thick liquid and all our hospital period at the time was Simlax spit up. And I was like, well, this is just not gonna work because it's not gonna get us to where we need to be. So that was actually really helpful to know. Um, since then, we now are stopping Infamil AR. And that is because the results we have indicate that in its ready to feed version, that it consistently provided slightly thick or half nectar liquid throughout the duration of the bottle feed, it was quite stable. It didn't increase or decrease thickness level drastically throughout that 30 minute period. And then when we look at the powder, that unfortunately, um, it, it did get to this slightly thick liquid consistency, um, but it, it wasn't stable. It didn't do that until further into the feed, about 20 minutes, and it continued to increase in thickness. So this is just indicating that if you have a child that you're sending home on this, you need to keep that in mind. So with that said, I'll wrap it up. We are um, in the process that we have, this is a science stand. This is um, a web portal that our consortium has been working on and providing online courses um, for clinicians in the feeding arena. And really our goal is to help translate science into clinical care so that we have more um, clinicians that are well-trained that have easy access to this information because I know reading these manuscripts um, after you're done working clinically is probably not your top priority when you're exhausted. So we have these available for student training, in fact, as well as clinicians. And then what we will be adding this year to this is a tab with clinical resources 
so that we have all of these thickening recipes and um, little idiosyncrasies as we do more ITSY testing available here. So it's really a point and click. I have a baby that's on Similac, 20 kcal, and you know what thickeners can I use in this age group and um, what would be the appropriate amount to add. And so we'll be adding that in here as well. And with that said, I will finish up. If you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to contact me. My contact information is right there. Um, you can follow us on social media. We post most of our research updates on there when they first come out. And um, I'll say if we're recruiting for the normal study right now, um, so if any of you are expecting and interested in being part of that study, we would welcome you um, to be part of it. Just send me an email and we'll get you the information needed. And with that said, I hope you have a great afternoon. We so appreciate your research and your clinical practice, and this, this has great meaning for all of us. Um, we do have time for a few questions, and not surprisingly, they have to do with thickening. So um, are you ready for a couple of questions? Sure thing. Okay. Um, this was at the beginning when we talked about, uh, or when you talked about the slide on thickeners. Um, what product was used as the thickener in those three studies? It was at the beginning of the presentation. Yes, I think that was the Krumerts 2016 study that was looking at the, if, if this is what was the reference one, is looking at the clinical thickening based on symptoms. Um, and that one they used Simply Thick and Thick and Easy. And they reported, reported different, different gastric effects between the two. So they didn't control for the thickener in that. And they also didn't control for the thickness level. So certainly a limitation of a, you know, a retro, that type of study design, but um, helpful to start with, I think. Okay, thank you. And the next one is about the reference that people were looking for, the reference for not using Simply Thick for under 12 years when they have the history of neck. Yes, so um, that was actually just straight off of the Simply Thick website. Um, so there's a couple places you can find out. I was trying to look up exactly where. Um, there's one in like the question and answer section all the way at the bottom of when you should use it and it indicates that in a couple spaces, but it's also listed on the back of the packets now. As I would say, just overall, like a lot of the thickeners used to not have any indications on the back for age. I, I know when I first started, none of them did. It just wasn't there. Um, but now most of the thickeners have, if you look at the back side, it has indications, just like any type of mat or anything else like that. And so I would encourage you to take a look at those. That's what I go off of for that type of thing. Okay, and due to time, we'll take one more question, but it's a multiple part question. <laughs> so um, how much formula did you mix up at a time for the IDDSI test? Um, let's just take that part first. Perfect, I can kind of run through those because I saw that okay. one. Go Great ahead. question. Go um, so we, for all of our testing conditions for the data I presented here, it, we mixed four ounce bottles. Um, the students mixed a new bottle, like they added new formula to a new bottle for each trial. And we wanted to do that because we know that just in mixing formula that can be variable and we wanted it more clinically relative. So we mixed four ounce bottles. Each bottle was a completely new mixture and we did not replace um, the liquid after and we, so specifically we um, drew the syringe from the bottom of the bottle because that's what the baby would be getting when they're drinking if it was inverted um, and then after we did the test on that then we disposed of that trial and then we pulled the next one off again because if a baby was drinking it that would be removed because they ingested it um, that being said we, um, in that same study, we also tested if we made like a big vat of it, like you would do for powdered formula at home potentially, and then warmed it up. So we have data on that. We're just finishing the manuscript. It should be out with the, well, I say out. It should be in three viewers' hands by the end of the month. So um, depending if they bless that or not, then that will be out hopefully soon. And um, we'll have that um, coming. We also have one looking at rice versus oatmeal coming out as well. And just one thing I noticed is on the slides for um, Science Stand is to find that, don't, don't put in the www part. We just took that out. So it's sciencestand.org. And as I think I've indicated to some of you in discussions, um, that is, you know, we're working on that as we can. It's kind of, 
it's just it, everything takes a lot longer than I ever envisioned it will. That's just one lesson in life I've learned. So um, we're, we put it up there because there's a lot of need for it, but um, we just ask you that you give, give us some grace as we try to add more modules to it and time to it um, as it's, it's a big undertaking. So. Great, thank you. And I know there are a few other questions, but we are out of time. So the, all the answers to your questions will have Dr. McGratton answer them. They will be on our website. And I just wanted to mention, I apologize for some of the slides were a little grainy. That was not Dr. McGratton's slides. It's something in the transmission in the, um, with the slides between here and there. And so um, when we post the slides on handouts on our website and on the recording that will be on the website, they will be more clear. So I apologize for that. Again, we appreciate all of your research and we look forward to hearing more about your future studies. So as we wrap up this presentation, we'd like to thank you, all of you for attending and our next webinar will be in late fall. Please keep on the lookout for that announcement. Thank you everyone and be well.